All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for giving us a new day in the midst of all the craziness of this past week. May you let us settle ourselves and focus on the truth you have to give us. Bless us as we study in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so we are in Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. If you want to get your Bibles, if you're following along in your Bible, of course, it'll all be on the screen. Say again. Galatians 2, 16. And we got halfway through this verse last week. That's all we did last week was half of this verse. And so we're going to review it real quick because there's so much in this one verse, I broke it down into four sections. So nevertheless, knowing that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Since by works of the law, no flesh will be justified. Now, if you go back up to the previous verse, we are Jews by nature and not sinners from the Gentiles. That's what he says in verse 15. And what he's doing is, Paul is drawing a contrast. We're the Jews. We have the law. We have the covenant. We were God's chosen people. Okay? And the Gentiles aren't. Okay? The Gentiles were not part of that Abrahamic covenant, you know, by nature, whereas the Jews were. And then, nevertheless, you know, even though we were God's chosen people, nevertheless, knowing that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus. Uh, what's the art? What's the circumstance in Galatia? In the churches of Galatia, the Judaizers have come in. They've come from Jerusalem, and they've been teaching the people that you must become a Jew in order to be saved. Even though Christ has you know come from God as the Messiah, you still have to be Jewish and part of that covenant to be part of the new covenant. You have to become a Jew in order to be a Christian. You have to be circumcised. You have to keep the law. You have to keep all the festivals in order to be a Christian. That's what they're teaching. And he, in the pre, uh, earlier in this chapter, we already have the account of Paul confronting Peter. Uh, you know, I confronted him to his face in front of everybody for his hypocrisy of, of associating with the Gentiles and then turning around and excluding himself from the Gentiles when the Jews came from James, from, from Jerusalem. So the nevertheless is a big statement. Okay, so we went through that, knowing a person is not justified by works of the law, you know, even though we were part of the covenant, nevertheless, knowing that no one is saved by the law, okay, we talked about the law does, the law shows us our sinfulness, our need for a savior, it's written on the hearts of all people and it puts limits on evil in the world and shows us how we are to live a God-pleasing life. The law has its purpose, okay, even for we who are Christians. Uh, we're not saved by the law. We have the passages on that. But through faith in Christ. We covered this last week. The law can't save. The law can only show you your need for a Savior. The law cannot accomplish the forgiveness of sins. It shows you you're guilty of sin. Okay? And then we got to the third section, is where we're starting today. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus, so we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Even we, who's he talking about? Paul's talking, even we who are Jews of the old covenant, even we have believed in Christ Jesus. You know, the law prepared the way, the old covenant prepared the way for the Messiah. The law was not given to save. Okay? So even we, Paul is saying, we have come to faith in Christ. That's how we are saved, not by the law. It's our passages. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have already believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Okay. First Peter, and he himself brought our sins in his body upon the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds we are healed. Uh, the Judaizers are saying Unless you're circumcised, unless you keep the law, you cannot belong to God. We see all the way through scriptures, it's faith that unites us to Christ, not the law. Knowing that you are not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious 
but with precious blood, as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Now it's interesting, who through him are believers in God. Isn't he God? Yes? Well, so what is Peter talking about? You've heard me harp on this over and over again. What is the primary relationship in the Bible? That we are to have a relationship with the Father. Mm -hmm. Jesus became our Savior to restore us to the Father. And, and that's where I think a lot of Christianity in our world today, especially in America, have missed the mark. Because in the Pentecostal bent, they focus on the Spirit. Jesus did His thing and gave us the Spirit. The Spirit's what it's all about. Uh, in the typical Protestant churches in America, it's all about Jesus. And the Father's ignored. Nobody talks about the Father. But everything that Jesus taught is that everything is about the Father. Everything is about... You know, the Father sent Jesus to accomplish forgiveness to restore us to the Father. The Father sent the Spirit so we can have faith in Jesus and be restored to the Father. Everything goes back to the Father because that's the primary relationship. The Father grieved the loss of His children and did everything necessary to save us and, re and redeem us and have us as His own again. And Jesus calls us His brothers and sisters. We share His glory. We sit on thrones with Him, all given by the Father. Everything is about the Father. And that's what Peter's talking about. Uh, for he was born over for the foundation of the world. God had already planned this. The cross was not an afterthought. The cross was a forethought. And that is hard for us to wrap our minds around. That, you know, if it was us, and God seeing into the future saw that Adam and Eve would sin, corruption would come, the world would be chaos for, from that point till the end of time, and, and there'd be suffering and heartache and sickness and disease and death and tragedies and, and rebellion and everything that there is, I would have said, not a good idea. Let's go to plan B. Right. I agree. Okay? It wasn't my But God, in His love for us, loved us when we were just an image in his mind, just a thought. And he committed himself to us before he created us. So that even though we would need salvation, he created us anyway, knowing we would need a Savior. So Christ was already determined to become our Savior before sin took place. And that's why you've heard me say this before. I believe the very first act of grace on the part of God was he spoke the words, let there be light. Because it was a gracious act. He spoke us, spoke, into, spoke creation into being, already knowing and committed to saving us from our sins before we even existed. You know? So creation was an act of grace on his part. You remember that video you uh, we found one time of Christ creating and molding? The, the person? The person. Uh, and he breathed the, the, the breath of life into him. Mm -hmm. I've always thought, what if right before he did that, he sees everything that's going to happen, and he gets up and walks away? Just a pile of mud. Just a pile of mud. There's something stopped him, he turned around, and he did it. Yeah. And that, in my opinion, is the love of God. Yeah. Some so, people, though, uh, they use uh, an excuse of, uh, for not believing in what kind of being would create us knowing that what we would become? And, and my answer to that is, is you've heard me talk about this before, why would you, when you got married, and you're just in all kinds of love and bliss and happy, you're newlyweds, and life is perfect, you don't need anything, why would you choose to have a child? <laughs> because you know there's going to be sleepless nights of sickness, you know there's going to be rebellion, you know there's going to be heartache, you know they're going to you know, do bad things, you know you're going to have to discipline them, you know you're going to have to spend a ton of money on them, okay? You know all the negatives that come along with having a child. And yet in your heart together, you want 
to have an object of your love that extends from you as, a, as husband and wife. You choose the heartache because of love. God the Father, Son, and Spirit desired to create, to have a being outside of themselves, but yet was part of them, made in the image of God, to focus their love upon, no matter the cost and the heartache. Because love moves us to love even when we know there's negatives involved. That's why God created, even knowing it was going to happen. The same reason you had a kid. If you thought your kid was going to be perfect, you were a fool. <laughs> okay? That's just the way it is. So that's the that's the motivation. Is he, you know, he was content in himself, Father, Son, and Spirit, holy, righteous, glorious. But he wanted to be able to share his love outside of himself. Just like a married couple that has a child. So, uh, you know, God raised him, raised Jesus from the dead, therefore, so that our faith and our hope are in God. What is God's promise? He's also going to raise us from the dead. That we're going to live forever with Him because of all that He's done. So, uh, so the point three, we believed in Jesus Christ so that we may be justified by our faith and not by works of the law. Point four, since by works of the law no flesh will be justified. What's the argument? You've got to keep the law in order to be a Christian. So Paul now states it plainly in this verse, since by works of the law no flesh will be justified. You can keep the law all you want and you're still a sinner. Because while the law can show you your sin and reveal your need for a Savior, the law cannot bring you forgiveness of your sins. It can only reveal them. So, now, that no one is justified by the law before God is evident, for the righteous one will live by faith. And do not enter into judgment with your servant, for no, living, for no person living is righteous in your sight. Indeed, there is not a righteous person on earth who always does good and does not and, and does and does not ever sin. Uh, nevertheless, knowing that a person is not justified by works of the law, but in faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, since by works of the law no flesh will be justified. Our passage, when you put it all together, lays it out. We say we have no sin, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. The Pharisees were real good at saying, look at me at how good I am. Isn't God happy with me? But what was their standard of measurement? I'm better than you are. They weren't measuring themselves with the holiness and righteousness of God. They are measuring themselves against you a filthy Gentile, or you, a common Jew. I'm a Pharisee. Look at how good I am. And so by human standards, I'm better than you are, so God must be happy with me. Or at least more happy with me than he is with you. Okay? And because they, couldn't, they didn't want to deal with the fact that God is holy and that God is pure. And so the, the law can't get you to being holy and pure in front of God. Only faith can. Okay. So any questions on that one verse? I broke it down in four parts to try to make it chewable chunks. <laughs> About that. So verse 17. But if, while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have also been found sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Far from it. This is a challenging verse. Okay? Everything you just said is we, being Jews, have come to faith in Christ so we can be saved through faith because the law won't save. But if, big, if is always a big word. If seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have been found sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? But sometimes different translations, so I have three more translations up there. First one is New American Standard. Then we have ESV. But if, in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. Christian Standard Bible. If we ourselves 
But if we ourselves are also found to be sinners while seeking to be justified by Christ, is Christ then a promoter of sin? Absolutely not. In IV, in IV, but if in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. Clear as mud, right? Not an easy verse. We're going to get to it. What then shall we, what shall we say then? That Gentiles who do not pursue righteousness attained righteousness but the righteousness that is by faith. However, Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness, did not arrive at that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as though they could by works. They stumble over the stumbling stone, just as is written, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and the one who believes in him will not be put to shame. So the Jews tried to be saved by the law, by works, with no faith, didn't work. The Gentiles approach God now through faith and are declared righteous. But I say that Christ has become a servant to the circumcision in behalf of the truth of God to confirm the promises given to the Father. Salvation is the Jews first and also for the Gentiles. Okay? Paul never winced at that. Every city he went to, he went to the synagogue first. So the Jews would have the opportunity to understand that Jesus was the fulfillment of the promises God made to them. And they were to turn from their works to faith in Christ. But the problem was, and you heard me say this many times, it was never intended to be about works. The covenant, the relationship with God was the covenant of blood and sacrifice, Mount Sinai, where the law was given, but the covenant was established through the shedding of the blood, not the giving of the law. The law was revealed, or given, to show them how to live as those who are in a covenant relationship with God. The law wasn't given to save them. But if the ministry of death, engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses, because the glory of his face, fading as it was, how will the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more, more with glory? For if the ministry of condemnation has glory, much more does the ministry of the righteous excel in glory. What is that referencing? Do you know? Remember, Bobby? When Moses came off the mountain, his, it, it, and here's, a, here's a, a way to maybe novicely explain it. His skin had absorbed the glory of God and was reflecting and radiating the glory of God. But as time went on, it began to fade. So I imagine a battery in a flashlight that's wearing out and the light gets dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. Because Moses didn't want people to see the fading glory, he put a veil on his face because he didn't, you know, he first he was glorious and it kind of frightened him. But then he realized the glory was fading because the longer he's away from God, the less he was reflecting the glory of God. So he put a veil on his face. That's what he's referencing. And what, are the, what, is, what is Paul calling it? He says, if the ministry of condemnation has glory, if the, if the law that was given has glory, and it can only condemn you, cannot save you, how much more glory has been given to the, to the ministry of righteousness? Because in Christ, we are actually made righteous before God. How much more glory is it there? <laughs> Hebrews. Jesus, on the other hand, because He continues forever, holds His priesthood permanently. Therefore, He is also able to save forever the one who comes to God through Him, since He always lives to make intercession for them. For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens, who has no daily need, like those high priests, to offer up sacrifices first for his own sin and then for the sins of the people, because he did this once for all time when he offered up himself. The law appoints men as high priests who are weak, but the word of the oath, which came after the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. His argument? 
The priest ministered according to the law over and over and over and over again. It never could, because it had to be over and over, it never completely did the job. Jesus did, Jesus did it once, and the job was done. Okay? The priest offered sacrifices continually. Jesus made one sacrifice, and now there's no need for any more because it accomplished what it promised. Absolute, full, complete forgiveness. So here's back to the meaning, Paul's argument. If we who have been justified by Christ are counted unrighteous, why seek justification in Christ at all? Remember the passage? Okay. But if, while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have also been found sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Far be it. If I've come to Christ, but that's not enough, I have to go to the law. I have to become a Jew in order to be saved, even though Christ has come. If I have to go to the law, then Christ isn't sufficient to save. So has Christ become a partner with that which is imperfect and sinful? Because if I have to have Christ and I don't have the law, I'm still guilty of my sins and going to hell. That's his argument. It's just a complicated verse. If we are justified by the law, tell me what has Christ achieved by his death and by his victory over sin and death? Either we are justified by Christ or we are made worse sinners by Him. If Christ wasn't sufficient to save us, all He reveals is that we are absolutely condemned. Because He couldn't do it. If we need Christ plus anything, then Christ wasn't sufficient. That's His argument in that verse, but it's a very complicated verse. So I put this up here. Christ is not the minister of sin, but the dispenser of righteousness and the giver of life. Christ is Lord over law, sin, and death. All who believe in Him are delivered from law, sin, and death. The law drives us away from God, but Christ reconciles God to us, for He is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Now if the sin of the world is taken away, it is taken away from me. If sin is taken away, the wrath of God and His condemnation are also taken away. So, that was Luther's explanation of that passage. To understand that Christ is sufficient in His death and resurrection to accomplish forgiveness. Why is Paul going to set the links to this? Because there are those who are saying that Christ's death on the cross wasn't enough. That's the argument. Christ wasn't enough. Okay? Uh, you've got to have the law. And so what is the, their argument, the Judaizers? If you got Jesus, that's good, but you have to have the law also. Become a Jew and be a Christian Jew. Or a Jewish Christian, whatever you want to call it. That's how you're saved. Paul's argument is Jesus plus anything means death. The gospel plus anything is hell. It's the gospel alone, which means salvation. The gospel plus anything is death. Because if you add anything to the gospel, you nullify grace. It becomes works. Does that make sense? For if I rebuild what I have once destroyed, I prove myself to be a wrongdoer. What did he destroyed. If I seek to preach and practice the law and proclaim that others must also, then, I, then am I not rebuilding the necessity of the law which I destroyed with the gospel? Galatians 2, yet it was a concern because of the false brothers secretly brought in who had sneaked in to spy on our freedom which we have in Christ Jesus in order to enslave us but we did not yield in subjection to them even for an hour so that the truth of the gospel would remain with you. Paul had to fight the unbelieving world that wanted to silence this idea of only one God in the face of all the idolatrous practices. And Paul had to fight Judaism that said Jesus is not the Messiah. And he had to fight the Judaizers who said, yeah, Jesus is the Messiah, but he's not enough by himself. 
three different, a three-pronged attack, if you will. The unbelieving world, the Jewish world, and the Judaizers, which are, you know, trying to pervert Christianity. Three different types of attacks constantly coming against the apostles. Now, how would we compare that to today? Or who, can we make a comparison? The unbelieving world certainly says they don't need Jesus. Right. We've got our way. Uh, or that all religions are the same or whatever. Uh, there, are, there is a, a certain segment of Christianity that wants to take us back to the Old Testament uh, festivals and rituals and laws and stuff like that. That if you're really going to be a Christian, you've got to be a Jewish Christian. You've got to go you know, keep the Sabbath, keep the Passover, keep the you know, festival of booths and Hanukkah and all this. You've got to do everything that the Jews do in order to be a Christian. You know, uh, I mean, it's out there. <coughs> Verse 18, continued, But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how is it that you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles to which you were, you want to be enslaved all over again? You meticulously observe days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that perhaps I have labored over you in vain. I beg of you, brothers and sisters, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. You have done me no wrong. So, he opens with, you have become, rather, not that you have come to know God, but rather to be known by God. God now has claimed you. It's God's action, okay? But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, that's God's action. That's grace. You didn't go to God, God came to you. You didn't choose God, God chose you. God has made you His child. Why would you go back to this, and as he puts it, weak and worthless elementary principles to which you were enslaved? Which was what? Meticulously observed days and months and seasons and years. All this rope meaningless keeping of the law did you no good because you weren't you didn't really know God and God certainly didn't know you and all that. Okay. For through the law I died to the law so that I might live for God. The law when I say the law of Moses condemns us, but the law of grace and forgiveness condemns the accusing law of Moses. The law leaves you with nothing. The law says you're toast. You are not only unworthy, unwelcome, but you are going to be cast away forever. That's all the law can do. For all who are of the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Curse is everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law to do them. Who is the only one that perfectly lived the law? Jesus. He's the only one who was born into this world sinless, lived sinless, and died as one who never committed a sin. He's the only one. That's what makes Him worthy to be our Savior. That's why He had to come into the world to keep the demands of righteousness that the law reveals that we can't keep for ourselves. Therefore, the law has become our guardian to lead us to Christ so we, we may be justified by faith. What does a guardian do? Teaches you right and wrong. Shows you your error. Shows you the, the way to live. Watches over us. Watches over you. But you've got to become an adult and stand on your own two feet. That comes with faith. The law reveals the truth. The truth is you can't do it. How are we doing time? And now we know that huh? it's to go. Okay. Now that we know that whatever the law says it speaks to those who are under the law, so every mouth may be closed and all the world may be come, become accountable to God. When judgment day comes. What is the standard of judgment? 
The law is part of it. Were you righteous? Were you perfect? Were you holy? The answer everyone gives, no. Okay. Did you have faith in Christ? Yes? No. Black and white. So, and you've heard me say this many times, what determines heaven or hell for a person? What is going to send a person to hell? Faith. Their sin? No. Lack of faith. No one ever went to hell because they were a sinner. God has provided the opportunity for forgiveness. You go to hell because you have no faith in Christ. Your faith in Christ, heaven. No faith in Christ, hell. Then, having gone to hell, you are judged and suffer or punished for the sins you committed. But you went to hell because you had no faith in the forgiveness God offered. You had no faith in Christ. So, you know, that's something that we need to ingrain in people. You can keep the law all you want. But when you're judged, you're judged whether you're a sheep or a goat. Whether you belong to the family of God or you're exiled from the family of God because you have no relationship with Him. It's about faith. And He Himself brought our sins upon His body on the cross when we might die to sin and live for righteousness by His wounds you are healed. I've already had that one passage. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ <coughs> in God. Again, back to the idea that the ultimate end of the relationship is to get to God the Father. Our life is hidden in Christ. Yeah. Can, can you explain that a little bit? Yeah. The, the part hidden in Christ? Is that the... Who you are as a simple human being is not who God sees. Okay. What does God see? He sees you as one who's covered in the blood of Christ. And so uh, the old in the in the time of the Reformation era. They would use the Latin phrase, simul ustus et peccata. I'm at the same time a saint and a sinner. From my perspective, as I look at myself, I see God's perfect holy will. I know I'm not perfect. I know I need a Savior, and I hold on to Christ through faith. From God's perspective, as He looks at me, does He see me in my sin, deserving of judgment? No. He sees me covered in the blood of Christ as one who is pure and holy and righteous and acceptable in His sight. I'm a saint. So I'm a saint from God's perspective. I'm a sinner from my perspective, always needing a Savior. But I'm, from God's perspective, His child, redeemed and loved by Him and blessed by Him. That's the tension we live in now. How has that happened? Because who we are, truthfully, is hidden. We are covered by the blood of Christ and we are declared holy to God. That's what the passage means. Thank you. Yeah. And because of that, we have you know hidden hidden with Christ in God. We all of a sudden are brought back to the Father again. Now Galatians 2.20 is a passage that most people know. Uh, if, uh, if you were part of evangelism explosion back in the 70s and 80s and 90s, it was one of the memory verses. Uh, it's a passage that, that many young Christians actually memorize. Okay? I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself up for me. Uh, how do we live now? Knowing we're justified by faith. Knowing we're reconciled to God. With everything that Christ has done, how is my life now living? For myself or for God? And so the idea of dying to self and living for God, this is one of the passages that points that out. In the same way the law kills, and a person lives with the reality of hell, so also the gospel kills, and the person lives with the assurance of heaven. The law kills and leaves you destroyed. The gospel comes and says, you've been trusting in yourself all your life. You thought you could do it. And what does the gospel tell you? You could never do it, so Christ did it for you. And so it, the gospel comes and gives you a life you could never have on your own. 
And it's the life that God delivers to you through faith in Christ. And so uh, the gospel kills and a person lives with the assurance of heaven. I'm no longer trusting in myself. I'm no longer relying on my efforts, but I'm living confidently because of what Christ has done. And I have the assurance of eternal life because He accomplished it for me and has given it to me as a gift. So the gospel enables a person to die to self, the desires of the flesh, and live for Christ. And that's where probably that one statement where American Christianity struggles the most. Because we've taken the reality of the gospel and made it a, uh, a license to sin. Permissiveness. Mm -hmm. And Paul talks about, shall I sin that grace may abound? It's not that we would say, because that was the part of the issue. If, if you get the grace of God covers your sin, then don't you want to sin a whole lot so you get a whole lot of grace? Some people are believing that. Okay? You know, I, 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 the more I sin, the more grace I get. That was one of the things that Paul had to struggle with in Romans, as he's writing. Okay? Uh, but that's not where Christianity is today. Christianity today, at least in our country, is Jesus did it, and so yeah, I'm forgiven. So if I go, whatever I do, I'm forgiven. So I can just go do whatever I want. Because, I, you know, my ticket's punched. No life insurance. Huh? Life insurance. Life insurance. Mm -hmm. um, and what, you know, you ever, uh, remember the movie, what was the movie? Kevin Costner and uh, Morgan Freeman. And uh, was it Robin Hood? Yeah. yeah. Yes, Robin and, Hood. And Morgan Freeman was bound to him because he had, because Robin Hood had saved his life. And until he repaid that debt of, by saving his life, he was bound to him, right? Mm -hmm. That was a cultural thing. So if I save your life, you, you are bound to me until you can repay that exact thing. That's kind of the mentality here. Not that it's a cultural thing. But Christ has saved our lives, and we are bound to him. Now we live our lives for him in light of what he's done for us. So we die to self and live for Christ. That means what I want, what I desire, you know, the gratification of my fleshly wants take a back seat to the will of God in my life. I live for Christ. And that's why you can say I've been crucified with Christ. I die to self and live for Him. What I want is no longer important. In light of His sacrifice for me, what I want is no longer important compared to. And what is Christ? What does Christ want? Everyone in the world to know what He's done for them. You know, for me to live in such a way that my life reveals Him to the world. That's what He wants. And so, I don't live for self. I live for Him. It's a self-sacrificing <laughs> desire to make Him known. Uh, and that's what, you know, and I live in the flesh, I live by faith, the Son of God loved me and gave Himself up for me. Because of His great love for me, my natural response is to love Him in return. That's to be the goal. But in our culture, we view the Gospels to come an excuse to be able to sin because I don't have to worry about it because Jesus took care of it. And that's called cheap grace. Bonhoeffer wrote about that. Cheap grace is, the, is using the Gospel as an excuse to live according to the flesh. Isn't that like antinomianism? The heresy kind of? Yeah, similar. Just the Christian version of it, yeah. yeah. Now, those who belong to Christ Jesus crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Uh, if it feels good, do it. What, what era was that? Was that the 80s? If it feels good, do it. You know, there are no limits, there are no taboos. You do what you want to do, it's okay. If it feels good, do it. And, and that's letting your flesh drive your life. And, you know, and if you, if you want to get technical, okay, your flesh, fallen sinful human nature, is not changed when you become a Christian. It's still fallen sinful human nature. Your spirit, which was corrupted and had no faith, 
is reborn when conversion happens and the Spirit comes. So you have your Spirit who is in relationship with the Holy Spirit and the Son and the Father. And you have your flesh which is corrupted and you know, when you're hungry, you want to eat. You need to go to the bathroom, you go. You know, you, you know everything. The flesh drives your body. The Spirit seeks to live according to faith in Christ. And they're clashing all the time. So we get to the illustration we've used before of two chariot, two horses dragging the chariot, one wants to lead you to destruction, one wants to keep you, you know, safe and secure. Which one's going to win? Which horse is going to win the tug of war? You know, the, the crevasse or the safe road? The horse you feed the most. You feed your spirit, the spirit dominates the flesh. You feed the flesh, the flesh will dominate the spirit. Cater to sin in your life, your flesh gets stronger, your spirit grows weaker. Cater to the things of God in your life, your spirit grows stronger, the flesh is made subject to the spirit. It's simple life. We've got two minutes. Far be it for me to boast except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. The world holds no allure. You see people with the big houses, all the toys, running, playing. You know, they're going to get old, they're going to get sick, they're going to die, and they're going to leave it to somebody else. And everything you have, everything I have, is eventually going to be thrown in the dumpster because it's worthless to everybody at some point. Nothing lasts forever in this world. The cars we have are going to be in a junkyard. The guns we have are going to be outdated and something new is going to replace it. It's going to be a relic on the wall. It's a souvenir of somebody. The money we have will be replaced and spent by other people somewhere else. The clothes we have will be given to goodwill and eventually thrown in the trash or in the dumpster. There's nothing that we have that will last. Nothing. For the law of the Spirit is life in Christ Jesus. Uh, in Christ Jesus has set us, set you free from the law of sin and death. Okay. Therefore we have been buried with Him through baptism to death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead of the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with Him in the likeness of His death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of His resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with Him in order that our, the, our body of sin, that's the flesh, might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. You know, crucify the flesh, kill the flesh, the desires of the flesh, so you can live for God. We're going to have to stop. I have more passages there to go through than i got time to go through. So we're going to... Bobby, don't forget. Offer Chris. Let's pray. Father, please be with us as we gather for worship. May your people who come be blessed by you, and may you be in the midst of all that we do together. In Jesus' name.